Um, okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, the theme for tonight is the empty begging bowl. So this is a story. It's coming to us from the Upaya Sutra that we've been studying now for a while. Um, and actually, <clears throat> if you've been coming on Sunday nights, let me begin by telling you this. So we've reached a part of the sutra where there's all these different, um, call them, you know, important moments in the life of the Buddha. And I mentioned as we were moving into this section that there are these like, you know, these major events in the life of the Buddha. The, the great renunciation, right? The leaving home, the attaining of enlightenment, the turning of the Dharma wheel, the teaching of the Dharma and passing into Nirvana. So these kind of highlights of the Buddha's life and they're pretty well established, like the story of the life of the Buddha. But the sutra that we've been reading is interesting because it's kind of like rewriting the history a little bit. And it's presenting all of these different things that the Buddha did, but as upaya. Now, there's another kind of list or a series of events that happened in the life of the Buddha. They are called mm, the nine torments. They're called the nine sufferings. Uh, those are the two translations that I've seen. There are these nine events that happened in the life of the Buddha that seem to be bad karma, that seem to be like the, 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 uh, um, the results of bad karmic action. And so there are these nine events, these unfortunate events that happened to the Buddha. We, we have discussed two of them so far. The first of these events was, it was that the Buddha, or Siddhartha, I should say, the idea that Siddhartha had to perform six months of austerities before becoming enlightened. And what we learned in our sutra is that the Buddha didn't need to perform austerities, but he did it as an upaya. Now, the idea here is, though, is that in the original version of these nine events, the idea was actually that the Buddha, Siddhartha, or at least a prior life of the being that would become Siddhartha, the idea is, is that being had committed a karmic offense in the past and to kind of pay for that karmic offense, the Buddha had to perform six months of austerities. There's another story that we've already talked about. We talked about this one two weeks ago, and that was when the Kadira thorn struck the Buddha's foot. And that was another one of these events where the, the striking of the Buddha's foot with the thorn was karma or the, the karmic consequence of an action in the past. Actually, what we learned was a murder long time ago, long, long time ago in the past. But it was something that had to uh, have its karmic result play out. So we've covered two of these nine events, and tonight we're going to cover the third, which is the time that the Buddha went begging and came back with an empty begging bowl. So we're, as usual, we're going to kind of talk about this story the way that it's originally described, and then we're going to read about it in our sutra. But I kind of want to zoom out and kind of mention a, a couple of things as a Mm, just preliminary remarks before we dive in. So what's been going on with these, these um, unfortunate 
events in the life of the Buddha. One of the ways that you can think about this, and, and it's kind of how I would like us to be thinking about this today or this evening, and it's, it's kind of could be summarized in a kind of general way of the question, why do bad things happen to good people? That is sort of the, the question in the air. It's sort of the question about these events. But the Buddha, the Buddha is so pure. The Buddha is so accomplished. The Buddha is so enlightenment, enlightened. How could these bad things happen to such a good person? So what we're also talking about, and, and now I'm going to zoom out even further, <laughs> it's not just about like why do bad things happen to good people. But since we are sort of talking about religion in, in so far as Buddhism is a religion, then we are also kind of talking about in a more broad sense, we're talking about what is called the problem of evil. Now, I, I often share with everybody like uh, tales of my uh, undergraduate education or my graduate education. And, you know, many of you know, in undergraduate, I was a religion major. So that's where all of this, all of this started in undergraduate when I took my first world religions class, got very excited about studying religion, and then became a religion major. And one of my favorite classes that I took as an undergraduate was called the problem of evil. <laughs> Great class. You know, I was very excited to take that class. Now, we mainly in that class, by the way, we mainly dealt with the problem of evil in the theistic religions. So the problem of religion in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it makes sense to sort of like to it's it makes sense to think about that because there's this problem it's why it's called the problem of evil and the problem is that there's this god <laughs> that's like all powerful and like all loving so why is god letting all of this bad stuff happen to good people so in other words the fact that there is evil in the world challenges God's authority in that sense. And so the religions, all the theistic religions, they need to make peace with that idea somehow. They need to explain to everybody why God is being so aloof <laughs> and not helping. And there's, of course, different theological answers for why God doesn't interfere. And different religions and even different sects within religions split off, not just about this question, but about other questions that are related to this, which is about the role of God. But there's no God in Buddhism exactly. Yet, there's still kind of a problem of evil in that sense. But this is where I kind of want to remind us of something I mentioned, oh, I don't know when it was, uh, many Sundays ago now, and what it is, is I want to talk quickly just about the original way that these nine unfortunate events were explained. Like why, like what's the Buddhist answer to this? Why did these bad things happen to such a good guy, the Buddha? And the original Buddhist answer to this, like you could say this is sort of the Hinayana or like the early form of Buddhism, the answer to this. If you take, for example, um, the Kadira thorn, the thorn piercing the Buddha's foot, the way that that's explained, and not just explained, but the way that story is used as a teaching device, is what they say is, is that the thorn piercing the Buddha's foot, yeah, that event was a karmic consequence of this other event that took place lifetimes ago. And the teaching in early Buddhism is about how 
karmic action of the body, voice, or mind produces karmic results. And that, that cause and effect relationship is immutable, is an understanding within the world of Buddhism. It is a natural law that is governing the world, this kind of cause effect. So what the Buddha says, or at least what the early tradition says, is that it was inevitable and impossible to avoid the Buddha's foot being pierced by the thorn, because that's the karmic consequence of that action. What makes a Buddha a Buddha, or what makes an enlightened person an enlightened person, is the way that they respond and react to that event. And so I told you, when I told you about the thorn piercing the Buddha's foot, there was a monk with superpowers who was who grabbed the Buddha and flew away with the Buddha trying to protect his foot. And the monk didn't want to see the Buddha get pierced. The Buddha was like, whatever. It was the monk that didn't want to see it happen. And eventually the monk tuckers out and he can't carry the Buddha any further. And sure enough, the thorn pricks his foot. But what he tells Madhulyayana is, yeah, it was going to pierce my foot. But the reason why I'm the Buddha is because it, I do not react to it in that way. So that is an interesting like entryway into the, the, the Buddhist answer to the problem of evil. And what it is, is it's sort of about separating events, things happening in the world, and separating those events from the way that we respond and react to them. And the basic idea is, is that the karma in terms of cause and effect, we cannot change that and we cannot alter it. But what we can change, what we do have free will over is the way that we respond. And that message is going to be much more clearly presented in tonight's story about the empty begging bowl. So we're going to kind of take that angle tonight on the Buddhist answer to the problem of evil. Um, yeah, so let's kind of get into it. Um, let me start. I'll start just by reading you the beginning of this. Well, actually, I don't want to read this because this is going to be the kind of um, the slight upaya twist on this. So all you need to know is that there's a question. And the question is, why did the Buddha once enter the city to beg for food and then come out with an empty begging bowl? All right. So that's the event. We're going to learn more about the follow up to that event. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of begging for food. I want to kind of set the, set the stage a little bit for this story and this event. So as most of you know, I'm sure, it was an, an original mandate, rule, precept of the Buddha or of Buddhism that if you were a fully ordained renunciant, a monk or a nun, one of the rules is that you beg for food every day. And by the way, originally in the old school, excuse me, in the old school form of Buddhism, begging for food every day is what constituted right livelihood. The definition of right livelihood morphs and shifts as Buddhism evolves and as a more established lay practice is established, then the definition of right livelihood changes. And as Buddhism spreads to other countries, right livelihood changes. But in the original days of the Buddha, livelihood, livelihood was literally about life. How do you stay alive every day? Livelihood was not, well, what's your occupation? <laughs> it wasn't about what you did. 
It was about how, how do you survive every day? How do you get food every day? And for the Buddhists at, at the time of the Buddha, the rule was you beg for food. And not only that, you cannot keep leftovers. So it's an everyday activity in that sense. And, you know, we could get into um, more kind of details about that life. I don't want to get too deep into it. I, I did want to share with you really quickly, if you've never seen one of these. Um, so this, if you can get the scale. So this is a traditional Buddhist begging bowl from Thailand. I got this in Thailand. I just kind of wanted to share with you what one of these sort of looks like if you've never seen a begging bowl. As you can see, it's rather big. This is an empty begging bowl in that way. It is traditionally made of iron or some other pounded metal in that way. This is a very, like, um, if you've never been to Bangkok, you've never been in Thailand, there's a, uh, just sort of outside of Bangkok, there's a whole long alley street and it's where these are made. And it's a whole big long alley where there's just people pounding out these begging bowls for the monks in Thailand. Because the monks in Thailand still do a form of begging. It's, it's rather ritualized nowadays. It's kind of rather performative in a way. It's not quite begging in the way that it was at the time of the Buddha. In other words, in, as I've seen it performed in Thailand, it's a procession. And there's a long line of lay people with their food just waiting. And the monks come through and receive their offerings. And so there's very little risk of coming out with an empty begging bowl in that sense. So just want to set the stage again for life at the time of the Buddha, in which this was the rule. This was the way that you survived by begging for food. Um, since we're talking about it, I will mention, because not everybody knows this, in the early days of Buddhism, like during the lifetime of the Buddha and shortly after, a monk or a nun was allowed to eat anything that came into their begging bowl. The only rule against uh, meat was that the animal couldn't have been slaughtered for you. It had to be leftover uh, meat. But the point is, is that in the early form of Buddhism, there was no prohibition against eating animal products. There was only a prohibition. Obviously, the monastics cannot slaughter animals, but there was also this rule that somebody can't get excited and slaughter an animal for the monk. It makes it an impure offering in that way. The rule or the, um, the vow, actually, it's not actually a rule, it's a vow, but the vow of abstaining from animal products, the vow of basically being vegetarian that a lot of people associate with Buddhists, that's exclusively a Mahayana bodhisattva thing. So it's part of the bodhisattva vows. And I don't know if you know this, but in East Asia, you, if you were going to be a, a monk or a nun, you would take the original 250 or so, there's about around 250 precepts, you would take all of those original old school precepts of a, of a monastic but if you're in East Asia, if you're in China or Japan, you would take an additional set of bodhisattva vows. And it's in the bodhisattva vows that you find the rule against, uh, or the rule for vegetarianism. So just to kind of, a, uh, to clarify that, if you weren't, uh, didn't know that about Buddhism. Um, yeah, so this is just sort of the basics. The, the, again, the background of what was going on here. Now, let's find out what happens. So 
the question again is, is why, why did this happen? Why did this unfortunate event happen to the Buddha, right? Well, the whole point of this is that a Buddha, a Tathagata, is free from karmic hindrances. And I'm going to, I want to talk about what it means again to be free from karmic hindrances, but let me just let that stay there for a second. So since a Buddha is without karmic hindrances, at that time, when the Buddha came up empty, it was because the Tathagata had pity for future monks. Those monks in the future who enter a city or a village to beg for food, but are given nothing because they lack blessings and merits, they will think. Even the Tathagata, the world honored one, who had achieved all the merit, even he once entered the city to beg for food, but came out with his bowl empty. Not to speak of us who have such few good roots. We should not become worried or annoyed just because when we beg for food, we are not given any. This is why the Tathagata appeared to enter the city to beg for food and appeared to come out with his bowl empty. All right, there's, there's a couple more paragraphs to that that I want to get into, but that is the upaya twist that I was talking about. So it wasn't that like... It wasn't that nobody liked the Buddha. It wasn't that the Buddha came up empty. It was actually out of kindness or compassion for future monks who come up empty and they're going to worry about it. So that they don't worry, the Buddha made sure that one time he came up empty so that the future monks could be like, well, even the Buddha came up empty that one time. I won't worry about it too much. <laughs> So that's the kind of upaya twist on this. And I want to kind of, yeah, let's circle back to this idea of being free of karmic hindrances. So what they're doing here when they interject this idea that a Buddha, a Tathagata is free of all karmic hindrances, they're kind of taking, well, the idea here is, is that it kind of sounds like, it kind of sounds like they're trying to keep the Buddha like extra pure. And this idea that like, it wasn't enough that like these bad things happened to the Buddha, but the Buddha, it didn't affect him. And so he's liberated. That wasn't enough. And so we're adding this extra layer, which says that the event, the bad event, actually the Buddha brought it on, <laughs> like invited it out of compassion for everybody. So not only is he not at fault, he actually is doing everybody a solid by, by doing this. <laughs> so it might seem like they are trying to elevate the Buddha to this like exalted level of, you know, flawlessness, absolute flawlessness in that way. And yeah, that is what they are doing in a way. I'm not going to I'm not going to say that's not what they're doing. But at the same time, we got to look a little more carefully at well, just at this idea of a tathagata, a buddha being, and let me get the language right, it is about them being free from karmic hindrance or hindrances in that way. So there's a few different ways that we could talk about this. I'm just going to quickly appeal because I don't want to make this a long talk about karmic hindrances. I just want this to be a little one. And I've kind of already talked about this in a prior night, so I'm going to appeal to that a little bit. 
But what it is, is I want you to be thinking about some general teachings that I've given you over the years in that way, but thinking about a general teaching that we usually call this teaching of no self, right? And the idea here is, is that we need to just remember that when the Buddhists talk about no self, there is a very particular idea of a self that they are talking about, which they are saying doesn't exist. It's a very particular idea of the self. And what that particular idea of a self is, it's the idea of ourselves that we have, that I have. And it's this idea of me. But when I say that, what did, like, somebody would come up to me and say, what did you do yesterday? And I'd say, oh, uh, me? Oh, I, I taught a couple of classes. I did that. So yesterday, I did that. And then a year ago, I did whatever, whatever. And then 10 years ago, I did whatever, whatever, whatever. And then, of course, we go all the way back to the day I was born. And the idea here is, is that in that description, there's a me that never changes. And what I mean by that is, is that I now have on an orange hoodie, but I didn't yesterday. I did a bunch of things a year ago. I did this, I did that. I want you to notice that the me, it's just me. Or what I, meaning the idea that I have in my mind is that there's just a me, but the me, keeps getting taller, or maybe nowadays I'm actually getting shorter. I've probably reached my peak, right? I've reached my tallest moment of my life. And now I'm getting smaller. I'm getting more gray hair. I'm go So there's all these changes to the body or whatever, but there's this idea that there's a me, an unchanging me, that has been just back there, behind the eyes, between the ears, receiving all these experiences. Oh, all, all through the years, there's just been me. That's the idea of a self that the Buddha said, oh, that's just something that right now, this state of consciousness, that's just an idea that this state of consciousness right now could think of, <laughs> could think in terms of, but all it is, all that self is, is a filter through which this present state of consciousness is filtering experience and saying, oh, look, it's my hand, my teacup, my, all my stuff. And so the teaching of no self is about that me that just somehow looms between the ears, behind the eyes, but is kind of unidentifiable. Like you, you would never be able to find where it is. So there's a delusion. It's what the Buddhists call it. It's the delusion of this consistent, persistent sense of self. It's an illusion. What there is, at least according to the early Buddhist tradition, is an ever-morphing, ever-changing configuration of five skandhas, which is, right here, right now, conscious. But this is not what was going on 10 years ago. This is this. So what I'm getting at is, if we can now, if you're following me on that, and if I can now just really simplify this, Unenlightenment, delusion, is clinging to this sense of self that exists over time. 
And as I like to say, or as I actually, as I like to pantomime, what we do is, is we grab all of those past configurations of five skandhas and we hold them all as self. So now all of those past events happen to me, not to that configuration of five skandhas, but to me. Even though the events of 20 years ago, they didn't happen to this body. They didn't happen to this mind. They happened to that body, that mind. But insofar as I identify with it, I grab it. And you know what else we do with this idea of self? It's the idea of where I'm going to be in 10 years. And so we grab the imaginary future self, the imaginary past self, and we hold all of that as our sense of self. So that's the painful, suffering, delusional way of being, which is all predicated on a faulty idea of the self. If we define a Buddha, an enlightened being, in the old school kind of Buddhist way, then it would be more about a consciousness that is completely purified, cleared out of that delusion of a self and is utterly present, utterly dynamically responsive to this moment and is not hindered by any garbage past or future. And by garbage, I mean worrying, anxiety, stress, this and that, ego, vanity, striving, all the things that surround an ego sense of self, a Buddha is in the present moment existing in that way. So if you're with me that unenlightenment is this delusional attachment to self over time, and enlightened Buddha is present completely in tune with the current configuration of five skandhas. And I want you to remember that the fifth skandha, consciousness, is changing thought moment to thought moment to thought moment. So every thought to the next thought to the next thought, you are born anew, a new being within that thought. Oh, no, nope, this thought. Oh, no, nope, this thought. And the idea here is, is that if you're still clinging to sense of self, that can feel a little dizzying, this idea of like, whoa, a new me every minute. But if you're, or not every minute, a new me every thought. But if you are not clinging to that old sense of self, then you are just present. It is not this fe feeling of like, oh, here we go again. Oh, I'm back. Oh, I'm back. That again, that's only interpreted through lens of self. So if everybody's following me on these definitions now of deluded suffering sentient being versus enlightened Buddha, what I want you to now be thinking about is how when a bad thing happens to me, there's kind of two ways. I, and, and there's only two because I've created these artificial <laughs> duality in this way, but there's two ways to respond to it. The deluded way we're attached to self or the enlightened way. And the deluded way is where the event happens, but it is filtered. That event is filtered through that lens of self and the event becomes, why me? Why did this happen to me? Not, oh, there's this event taking place. <laughs> but it is then coupled with this sense of self. So what I'm getting at is, is that there is an, an, an emotional, mental anguish that comes from physical events in that way. <laughs> 
Whereas the a Buddha, an enlightened being, being more in tune and present with the configuration of skandhas is more just dealing, and I wouldn't even say dealing, but just experiencing the event, but without the extra garbage of me and mine and why me in that way. By the way, I should have said this earlier, and I meant to say this earlier. This is the story about the Buddha going and begging and coming up empty. But I would really encourage you tonight to be translating or interpreting this in your own way to basically be thinking about like, well, responses to not getting what you want. No matter what you want in that way. But what we're talking about is this idea of, let's say you went out into the world and you went out to get something and you, in a way, wanted to get that thing and then you came up empty. How would you respond to that? Today or tonight, this lesson is about that, of how to respond to these things in that way. Okay, everybody doing good? Yeah, no. I'm a little confused about the uh, not having karmic hindrances. Mm. So I, I followed kind of the arc of all of it, but I, I wasn't sure where that fit in. Is it that, I mean, I get that, um, is it about not connecting what is happening now to the past or future and not sort of caring about it? Is it or is it actually, you know, that, you know, if I'm, if I'm a Buddha and I'm walking down the street and I accidentally, you know, step on an insect, won't there be repercussions? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Confused about. Yeah. So let me, let me try to kind of rework that a little bit. I hear you. I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, Noam. Let me, let me use something I'm going to use an example that's rather, um, it's just, it's rather trite or whatever, simple, but I feel like sometimes those are really easy. So let's say, let's say, oh, actually, I'll try to make it an even better uh, analogy. Let's say, let's say, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm trying to construct my, my scenario here. But what I'm trying to think of is, I'm trying to think of a scenario in which I'm going to use myself. And let's say a couple of years ago, let's say I was um, not, let's say not very cultivated, not very kind, not very compassionate, right? So let's say a few years ago, I was much less uh, cultivated in that way. And so let's say during one of my Dharma doors talks, I said something negative or insulting about another Dharma teacher, let's say. So that wouldn't have been a very good thing for me to say. But that's a couple years ago. And the person that I insulted, let's say, only gets around to hearing what the insulting thing I said, like recently. And let's say in the interim, so over the last few years, let's say I've done a lot of work, cultivated a lot and like grown a lot and developed a lot and have really, you know, like through wisdom, understood why harsh speech and malicious speech is just negative. Like I really get it now. But let's say that now that person that I insulted, or let's say fans, let's, so we'll, we'll keep that teacher pure, but fans of them get upset about what I said. And so then let's say one night I'm teaching Dharma doors and we get Zoom bombed by all of these people hurling insults 
calling me stupid, calling me this, calling me that. So the fact that they're doing that is the karmic consequence of the thing I said. Now I have two, again, for simplicity's sake, I have two options. And what I want you to notice, karmically speaking, Noam, about like this idea of karmic hindrance, I want you to think about a scenario in which I haven't developed. I want to think a scenario I haven't cultivated at all. I'm the same exact person I was years ago. So as soon as they get on and they're insulting me, because I am still ego, egoed out, egocentric, I'm going to hear those insults respond from ego and I'm going to keep the karma ball going. So I will probably now increase my insults of these people who are defending that idiot, da, 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 da. And now that's going to just, whereas because I've grown, they are insulting my ego and I am now compassionate for them. And not in a, in a passive aggressive way, but in an actual, I'm, my ego's not hurt. I've developed. And I am now actually extending loving kindness and compassion to these people who are insulting me. That's the difference between a karmic hindrance where you keep the ball going versus being free of karmic hindrances. And then you don't keep that ball going. So, yeah. Oh, good. Yay. All right. So I actually have so much planned for tonight. You wouldn't know it. I've got so many different things re all related to like food and begging and all these interesting things. So I do, we need, we must finish this section of this. But before we do, I really want to share something with you. And I I know me, and I know that if I don't do it now, I will you know, flutter away to other ideas. So before we finish this version of the story, I want to share with you a beautiful poem. So there is this book called The First Free Women, uh, Poems of the Early Buddhist Nuns. I cannot tell you how much I like, love this book. And I'm going to read to you a poem from this book. And I want you to know, if you're not familiar with this book, I want you to know that it's a new, like very new translation of this book called the Theragatha. So the Therigatha, a gatha is a poem, of course, and the Theri. T-H-E-R-I, are the female elders of the Theravada tradition. So you might be familiar with the word Thera, T-H-E-R-A, which means the elders, but the male elders, the Theravada. Well, the feminine version of Thera is Theri. And these are poems from early Buddhist venerable nuns. This version that I have here, translated by Charles Hallisey there, this is actually a bilingual version with the Pali, or at least the Romanized Pali on one side and the English translation on the other. This is Harvard University Press, very high quality translation, very literal very scholarly. Whereas this is a new translation of portions of this, but done in a much more uh, free form, almost interpretive way. It's not a line by line, word by word, literal translation. It's a much more um, in fact, they have a beautiful introduction where they describe that they are not translating this word for word, that it's more kind of experiential. I'm actually going to read to you both versions because I'll 
would love to share with you uh, the way that they differ. But I want to share with you the, the version from here. It's my favorite of the two. So this poem, and if, by the way, if, so if you have this book or if you ever go get this book, uh, I'm on page 20. This is a poem by a nun just known as Dhamma, which is the Pali pronunciation of Dharma. So it was a nun who had the, the name or the Dharma name, Dharma. So. Another day, walking in circles with an empty begging bowl, leaning on my staff in the middle of the road, my whole body shaking with hunger. What little strength I had left. As I was falling to the ground, I saw. I was the spoonful of rice and this whole world, the bowl. All right, beautiful poem. I think you understand why I chose this one. It's in many ways the exact same kind of idea, going into town to beg for food and coming up empty. Now, the sentiment of this poem, I, and again, I really love this. I think it's really beautiful. Let me read you the original version, though, just so you can hear You know that they added a little bit. Again, it's a rather interpretive. So the original poem is very simple. It just reads, wandering about for alms, but weak, leaning on a stick with limbs shaking. I fell to the ground right there and seeing the danger in the body, my heart was freed. So very different in that way, but the very much exact same message in that sense. So if I go back to the original, the, uh, the, sorry, the, the first one I read, she says this, the way they interpret it, I just think is so beautiful. This idea, right, that so she's begging, came up empty, and she's basically starving, right? Starving of hunger and is about to pass out. And as I was falling to the ground, I saw I was the spoonful of rice and this whole world, the bowl. So that is a very Buddhist sentiment there. And this, and by Buddhist sentiment, I mean the sort of the, this kind of interdependent macro micro view of the world, right? where from one perspective there she was just trying to get a little spoonful of rice and then this very profound view of the decomposing body as an offering to the world in that way this idea that her own body going into the earth is like an offering of a spoonful of rice in that way and that relationship to the body which is, of course, formally articulated in this version, seeing the danger of the body. This, of course, is a very early Buddhist sentiment. In many ways, it's a Buddhist sentiment writ large, but it's very much a part of the early Buddhist tradition, which is to really view this body as a burden. And I say burden because last week I read a sutra called The Burden, and it was about this body. And so, obviously, we are not talking about, um, and in fact, this is a, a point that makes Buddhism very interesting. Buddhism, of course, is very, um, it's very, like, anti-violence, anti-suicide, I, I is what I want to say. And so what I mean is, is that it's this very delicate balance between a kind of a dis, not a disgust, but a kind of a distaste for the body where you're not like obsessing about it or clinging to it, 
but not to the point where you are um, begrudging the body. You hear this a lot in the world of Buddhism, not begrudging the body. So you're not, again, overwhelmed by it, but you're also not pushing it away. It's this very, very upekshik, equanimous kind of attitude towards the body in that way. And the idea is, of course, is that we are talking about, at least as far as the sutras go that I'm reading, we are talking about food. And we're talking about this idea of like sustenance and getting food to survive and then not getting the food to survive. And yes, the story about the Buddha, the idea is, is that he's that he originally didn't get a bowl full of food because of past karma. But now I want to keep reading the the section here because I definitely I want to get to like the end of this because it's so important. So I do I will read this because I might have a reason to refer to it in a moment. So after our opening paragraph about why the Buddha made it seem as if he didn't get any food, it goes on to say, if you happen to say that it was because of the devil, because of the demon Mara, Papillon, the evil one. So if you say that it's because Mara confused the minds of the elders and Brahmins in the city so that they would not give the Tathagata even a handful of food. Oh, yeah. Don't think that even though that's the original answer that the, the early tradition gave. The reason why the Buddha came up empty is because Mara went around and told or, or actually like put the idea in the minds of all the people in the town to not give the Buddha food. So the original story was that this was a plot of the devil or of Mara. But this is telling us, no, no, no. Don't think it was because Mara confused the minds of the people in the city and that's why the buddha came up empty no don't think that why because the demon king mara papian could not have prevented the tathagata from receiving food at that time the buddha by his miraculous power caused mara papian to confuse the minds of the people in the city the Mara, the demon king, could not have done this by his own power. Okay, so I might come back and talk about Mara confusing the minds of the people of the city, but let's hold off on that for a second. So, yeah, so this is the Buddha talking now, and he says, at that time, meaning when I came up empty, at that time, I was complete, completely free of karmic hindrances. In order to teach sentient beings, however, I appeared to come out of the city with my bowl empty. When I and my assembly of monks were not given any food, the demons and the gods all thought, do the Buddha and the monks become worried? when they acquire no food? And so, that night, when they saw the Buddha and all of his monks, they found that they were not worried or annoyed at all, and that they were neither elated nor depressed, feeling just as they had before they left. Seeing this, 7,000 gods began to have respect and have faith in the Tathagata, whereupon the Buddha, he says, I explained the Dharma for them. And as a result, they obtained clear Dharma eyes regarding all phenomena. And just to finish this off, a little while later, some of the Brahmins and the elders from the city 
heard that the Buddha had great awesome virtue. And so filled with sincere admiration, they went to see the Buddha, bowed down with their heads at the Buddha's feet and repented all their faults. The Tathagata then taught them the Four Noble Truths, and as soon as he explained the Dharma, 20,000 people acquired clear Dharma eyes regarding all phenomena. This is why the Tathagata entered the city to beg for food, but came out with an empty begging bowl. This was all the Tathagata's upaya. All right. So the, the main reason why you know, I, I wanted to read that and make sure that we got to it is because of that part, that idea of all the gods wondering how this would affect the Buddha and the monks. They go, and sure enough, right? They, the gods found that they were not worried or annoyed at all, right? And that they were neither elated nor depressed. So that's kind of the message, you know, that I've been trying to kind of get across tonight, that idea that, yeah, this event, the Buddha and the monks not getting any food, that was the karmic event. That's like what happened. But what is important is how the Buddha and the monks responded to that, which is that they were not annoyed or agitated. And, and I want to talk about this for a second. And this idea that they were neither elated nor depressed. So I can't stress this enough that, you know, this is really like, at least for me as a practitioner, something that I have kind of come to realize slowly as I've been practicing. It, it took me a while and I've had to grow up in a way, but it's about. Like, I think what I've matured to appreciate about Buddhism is that I think, well, let me put it to you this way. Of course, when I was young, I wanted elation <laughs> in that way. And I, you know, wanted to avoid, avoid depression. And then for some reason, when I was like kind of more in my 20s, early 30s, I actually kind of... <laughs> wanted to be depressed in a way, or at least like a, call it like Gen X, you know, whatever, but that kind of depression almost seemed something in that way. And so what I've realized in my, my 40s, in my maturity in that sense, is, you know, Buddhism is always talking about this middle road, this middle path. And one aspect of the middle path is it's this middle path between elation and depression. And it has taken me a while and, and again, a, a, a maturation to really appreciate the, and like, I don't, you know, what would I even call it? I, I would, I guess, call it pleasure in that way, but the pleasure of that equanimity, the pleasure of that, spot in between elation and depression. And again, in, in my youth, you know, I thought it was about maximizing elation in that way. And now again, like as I've developed as a practitioner and as a teacher, I've just come to realize that the noble truth of suffering, the first noble truth, it's about how both of those are suffering even though we think the elation is not suffering. Like that's actually an aspect of the moha, of the confusion. It's the idea that the, elate, the state of being elated, it's the idea that that's not suffering, right? But the truth or the noble truth of suffering is about how, no, 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 that's suffering just as much as depression is suffering. The thing about that one though, is that it's tricky. It's tricky because it feels so good when it's happening. But the reason why it's suffering is because the moment you don't have that, you're suffering. And you're suffering 
from not having that thing. So now all of a sudden, the thing, whatever it is, it could be a drug, it could be an activity, it could be a anything, entertainment. But the idea is, is that if you need that thing in order to be happy, you have a dependency on it in that way. And the problem with dependency is that it's only good when the thing is there. And so as I teach Dharma, as I practice Dharma, it's about conditioning ourselves to need externals, conditioning ourselves to need things in order to be elated or needing certain things to be a certain way in order to not be depressed. And the idea is, is that if we could free ourselves up from that polarity of elation and depression and sort of settle in that sweet spot in the kind of middle there, the teaching, the idea of Buddhism is, is that's where the real bliss is. The bliss of freedom, independence, sovereignty, all of those ideas. So, okay, questions, comments, answers, ideas about anything that's come up tonight. Anything. Hmm? Yeah, Maria. Oh. One second, Maria, you're still muted. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Joe. So um, just um, wondering what your thoughts are or what your knowledge is around um, sort of how some of these more enlightened, accomplished people might have dealt with like, um, maybe not something so much of a hindrance, but just the strong emotion that comes with certain states like um the loss of a near loved one i feel like there's a story about one of these arhats or ananda or maybe even the buddha having a weeping moment but i can't remember hmm. what that was but um so it feels like there's there are aspects of um human emotional existence that no matter how much we um, sort of cultivate and enlighten, um, we're bound to be affected to some extent by that. Um, mm -hmm. Just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, in general, the in general, what I would kind of want to say about that is so yeah um in general so my feeling about buddhism in dealing with something like you you mentioned so let's take um the loss of a loved one and let's take that so the way that I kind of understand this practice, in particular, when it comes to something like that, it's this very delicate practice of not turning away, but also not digging deeper. And again, it's a very delicate balance, but there's a way in which, of course, from negative emotions, we have sort of two general movements, which is we either want to block it out and turn it away, and in a way what we would call repress it, or there's a way in which staring at it reminds us of it, and we lean deeper into it in a way. And this delicate practice of Buddhism is about observing these emotions and what i mean is is that you know it reminds me a lot of we were talking it might have been last week but it probably was two weeks ago and i think it was in dharma doors on a sunday night and i was talking about or i might have been talking about when you 
stub your toe and it hurts, there's a way in which you can observe the pain of that passively, like objectively, where you are not turning away from it, but you're not moving into it. And there's a way in which the very pain, the sensation, it's still the sensation, but with that more passive objective view, there's a way in which it doesn't hurt as much and eventually doesn't hurt at all. Well, emotional pain is exactly the same way, which is that like you take like, like, um, so take, for example, the loss of a loved one. If you look at it and I'm on a, I'm all like, if you're, if, if I'm like hemming and hawing here, it's because I get very, I don't, you know, want to offend anybody. I don't want to like, when I start talking about the uh, deceased loved ones, it's like, can I just pray? Can I just do that? <laughs> but my answer in that way, if we look at say the loss of a loved one and there's this emotion, we can look at that emotion and observe it and be with it. But one of the things that we would want to do is a sort of honest assessment. And I'm now, now I'm going to speak specifically about loss. So there's a way in which if you kind of think about the psychology of loss, the psychology of losing, say, a loved one, it's a complex psychology because there's sort of the, the, the grief and the pain of, of like, you know, maybe the person, maybe it wasn't a pleasant death. And so you, the heart is going out for the person. And so there's that em emotion involved in it. But you might notice in that emotional complex of loss, you may notice the mind is upset and responding from like from having lost something, but as if it were a possession of theirs. And the thing about it is, is that people are not possessions of ours. They are loved ones of ours. And so what I'm getting at is, is that it's healthy and helpful to disambiguate. Am I suffering because I'm not getting what I want, which is my loved one? Or am I suffering from compassion and meta loving kindness for them, for their loved ones, for their family? Like, so what I'm getting at is, is that if we can manage that delicate, passive observation of these emotional states where we are not turning away, but not leaning in, we have a better chance of separating out those complexities of these things. I, I say this a lot too, regarding um, relationships and it has to do with love. It has to do with caring. It has to do with be being in a relationship. I'm in a relationship, I'm married. And I often get asked this question about, uh, you know, it's the question regarding love and attachment and these ideas of like, wait a minute, like, isn't, is the Buddha saying that I shouldn't love my, my partner and all of these things? And my, my, my answer to that and what I've been teaching since, oh, I've been teaching this for a long time. What I kind of realized early on is that there's two different ways to be in a relationship. One is where the person is an object and they are mine. And that mentality that this person is mine, that now lead, can lead to jealousy, envy, and all of these other kind of nasty emotions because the partner is being objectified. They're being turned into an object that is owned or possessed by somebody. I would say that's not a healthy way to be in a relationship. I would say, yeah, that's what the Buddha's talking about, that that's attachment and that's clinging and that's a problem. 
But there's another way to be in a relationship where you don't objectify the person and you don't own them like they're a thing. You respect them as a equal. You respect them as a human being in that way. And you love them for who they are. And that's a whole other way of being in a relationship. And I would circle back now to what I was saying about suffering loss by looking at that same dynamic. Are you upset because you lost something? Or are you upset because of the reality of loss, like meaning the sadness of all of that? So I hope that helps, Maria, or at least add something. Yeah. So um, just, you know, thinking about cultivating equanimity and bringing that. So it's not that you know, we're trying to be emotionless. Um, and I'm not sure we could be. Um, but when we cultivate equanimity, it allows those things to soften, gives us that spaciousness, that distance between sensation and um, yeah, how we're relating to it. Um, so, so yeah, that's the best answer around that particular, like, subject around how we deal with death and loss um, that I've gotten so far. <laughs> so thank you. Happy I could say that. Yeah, and, and just a quick follow-up on that. The, the deeper psychology or the deeper kind of reality, and it's why I love Buddhism with this, this approach, it's, I feel like Buddhism really recognizes that repression like if we just ignore these things, they fester and they, they like, they don't stay hidden for long in that way. And they kind of come back worse. So repression or ignoring is bad or um, unwholesome or unhealthy in that way. But also what Buddhism recognizes about conditioning, it has to do with like, um, how can I put it? Can, like, um, so let's say someone, you know, comes up to me and, and delivers me to, for me, delivers the bad news that a, I've lost a loved one. So th upon immediately hearing that, I'm going to have a reaction. And it might be, you know, a kind of out of control emotional reaction in that way. What the what Buddhism seems to recognize is that the next time I revisit that idea, if I meet it with the exact same response, I've now just conditioned that a little bit deeper. And pretty soon, if I keep revisiting that memory or that emotion with that same response, it's going to become impossible to back out of this. Thus, the importance of that in like initial calm state of mind and actually, and this is where the mind training comes in. This is like we train or we practice in that way to be ready, to be ready to receive some bad news, to be ready for thorns to pierce our feet. But the point is, is that if we are ready, in terms of we have cultivated a degree of equanimity, what that means is, is that when we hear the news the first time, we might be able to stay a little more calm. And what that means is that then the next time that memory comes up, it will not be associated with the same mental anguish. And then I can really just observe it. And now we notice it can eventually go away in that sense. But so that's what we're up against is this wild mind of ours in that way and the way it works. So, all right, any more questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right. Um, since we do have a little bit of time, 
I want to share one more idea because I don't know where else I would ever fit this in to a Dharma doors, although I could probably do a whole Dharma doors on it. There's one Buddhist idea that you don't hear a lot about. It's from the old school, but it actually makes its way into the Mahayana and even the Vajrayana. And it's a really interesting idea. And it has to do with what gets translated as sustenance. So there's a Sanskrit word that the Buddhists use, and it's called ahara, A-H-A-R-A, -A -A, ahara. Ahara translates as sustenance or sometimes nutriment. But what's interesting about Buddhism is that they identify four forms of ahara. There are four forms of, of nutriment or sustenance. The first one is food. <laughs> like food. <laughs> if you're like me, you're curious what the next three are then. <laughs> so in addition to food being a sustaining nutriment there is also that sentient beings, all sentient beings, and by the way, this is important to know that in the world of Buddhism, there are non-corporal sentient beings. So there are sentient conscious beings, but they do not have a physical body. Therefore, they do not actually need the nutriment of food. The other three forms of nutriment, though, the first is sparsha, contact. That contact is a form of nutriment. And I find that that is very interesting because we, of course, in a way know that infants and you know babies, they need to be touched. It is, it's literally a form of nutriment that if a, if a child does not receive contact or touch, there, there's a, a malnourishment. So that's an interesting one there in terms of a nutriment or a, a, a substance or sustenance in that way. The third, the third form of nutriment is basically samskara, is our habits in a way, a kind of um, it, it this gets tricky because the idea of samskara is tricky. In Buddhism, we talk about this idea of conditioning or samskara, but you kind of need to know that in the world of Buddhism, conditioning, it's kind of like everything we do is conditioned. Our breathing, our bodily movements are all conditioned. Our voices are conditioned in the specific language that we speak. And even the thoughts that we have are ultimately actually conditioned, meaning we think we're just thinking freely, but we're not. We are responding with thoughts, but we are responding to things that are being presented to us. So Samskara is a tricky Buddhist idea because it constitutes kind of all of activity in a way. So the idea is, is that a, a certain form of activity is a form of nutriment or a form of sustenance. And then the fourth ahara, the fourth form of, it, of substance, sustenance is consciousness, is actually like thinking. And these are four very, they, they like get more and more subtle in that way. They go from the gross, the mean, the, the just out there, all the way to consciousness. And all sentient beings, in a way, feast off of these four things. All sentient beings are out there feasting on food, feasting on contact feasting on mental activity in that sense of 
conditioning and also feasting on ideas, feasting on consciousness. What's interesting though, is that if in the early Buddhist tradition, and you need to kind of know or be thinking that the early form of Buddhism was much more austere than later forms of Buddhism. So even though they were talking about the middle road back in the day, the middle road back in the day was still pretty harsh by our standards. But in the more ascetic, the more kind of, uh, kind of that original form of Buddhism, they actually were into the idea of cultivating oneself to not need sustenance all four kinds of sustenance. And so you actually would cultivate it to a certain degree to which you actually didn't need food. And you didn't need sensory contact, which means closing the eyes, closing the ears, closing all the sense doors. And then you don't need, or the idea is you don't need mental conditioning. And so you would want that to kind of run its course and in a meditative state, eventually not have mental conditioning and eventually not have consciousness. But you need to, whenever I say that, or whenever you hear that within the world of Buddhism about not having consciousness, we need to clarify something. And what that is, is, is that We think in you know, we have a tendency in English to associate consciousness with being, <laughs> with like existing, being alive, so to speak. But we need to appreciate that within the world of Buddhism, what is called vijnana, this fourth ahara that we're talking about, this idea of consciousness, that is only one mode of mind and in in fact it is a very faulty mode of mind and the idea of vijnana the problem with vijnana and the way the reason why you may want to starve yourself of vijnana is because that way of thinking meet what we call consciousness but again it's this word vijnana the idea is, is that vijnana is always me being conscious of something that is not me. So vijnana is, in fact, vijnana is often translated as object discrimination. So it's about objects out in the world, discriminating them from one another. But predicated on the idea that they are all not me. The thing about that is, is that if you, again, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know this already, it's understanding that when I'm a mat, not even when I'm imagining, but when I am looking, when you are looking at this cup, there is a cup that is emerging in your mind. And I have no idea what that cup looks like. In other words, any ideas, and they don't have to be ideas, they can be visual phenomena, but the version, the version that you're experiencing is unique to your sensory organs. It's unique to your mind and the way that your mind processes information and therefore, the cup that you're seeing, again, it's your own cup. And therefore, it is not an object that is other than you. Vijnana, though, is based on the idea of subject-object. And so the point is, is that that mode of being that mode of mind, that all of this gets tricky to talk about in English that way, but the mode of mind, which is 
vinyana, it's not, it's, it's faulty, but the idea is it's, it thinks that what it's experiencing is, is outside of itself when ultimately it's really not, but not, not from any kind of crazy emptiness, wild Mahayana point of view, but really just from basic science, which says the version of things that you're experiencing are unique to you, and therefore they are not separate from you. But the mode called vinyana presumes that it is. And so there is a reason to not think in terms of vinyana, to not think consciously in that way. But to think without that consciousness in that sense. But again, as soon as I say that, you would think, well, if there's no consciousness, then it's lights out. No, 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 no. There are mo other modes of mind in that sense. So, All right. Thanks for listening to my little spiel about the four ahara, the four forms of sustenance. Um, I was going to try to work a kind of empty, empty begging bowl of the mind in the, that last part, right? No consciousness, and all, but it didn't work out. So... <laughs> All right, everybody, that's it for me.